Department. My name is Ian Sanderson, is in healthcare research and administrative informatics, and we have uh, two excellent speakers who are going to talk to you about that today. Although I was on the program to talk, I have to say I've given my slot to John Speakman, uh, who will be coming uh, second. So we've got uh, 45 minutes or so to talk about that. Uh, that golden age of research informatics that I was, I was, I, 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 I you know, I'm, I, I believe I was forced to think about it because of that panel. Uh, but we are far enough behind and early enough in, uh, in our product, in our development life cycle that I think uh, embracing open source and making our, our, our products uh, maturely open source is, is the challenge of our particular field. Now, there are many other examples in healthcare, and I don't think we will we'll be, be touching that. But today, in these particular talks, we're going to be talking about research informatics. So my first speaker is uh, Dan Hausman. He's an MIT graduate. He's the managing director of Recombinant uh, and founder of Recombinant Data Core. They're a company that are providing services to a number of open source or quasi open source projects that, I, that are on the cusp of becoming mature projects. So he's faced with the particular challenges of uh, uh, of, of working and, and creating a, a business out of that particular sphere. So Dan is going to talk about this particular area for us. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Ian. Um, seeing as there are other people speaking, like Joe Zonker, Brockmeyer, uh, Mad Dog, I, I wanted to call myself Dan the Dude Houseman because <laughs> I need a good street cred open source name. Um, so we'll start with the early stage of research informatics, and we can go back to 1747, which I consider to be the, the, the first research informatics project, which is Joseph Lind on the HMS Salisbury decided he was going to test who could or couldn't get cured from scurvy by feeding them different things. Uh, he discovered that a quart of cider daily for two patients worked fairly well, uh, but two oranges, one lemon, but they ran out of fruit in six days, really did cure scurvy on the boat. Um, back then, you could do studies with about uh, in this case, it was 12 people. Uh, now we have to do studies with 40,000 patients to do genomics to actually get reasonable levels of signal. And much like with this, a, a lot of the low-hanging fruit's been picked. Um, if we move forward another 100 years or so, um, back in 1847, uh, Ignat Semmelweis discovered that between two clinics, the midwives who were delivering babies were having a much better luck at not killing their patients uh, versus the doctors. When they did the analysis of what was happening, what they found was um, doctors had recently taken up a change, which was to do uh, pathological anatomy, which means they were working in one lab, working with cadavers, and then moving over to deliver babies. Result was a huge spike in um, purple fever, and he managed to invent chlorine hand washing as a solution. You can see on the right hand side, he cured a whole lot of these problems very quickly, but the response afterwards was fairly negative. Uh, folks didn't believe him. His employment was terminated. He opened a letter to critics after going mildly insane, calling them irresponsible murderers and ignoramuses, um, and ultimately he died in an insane asylum. And the result of his work was they went back to doing what they were doing before, which was from uh, after he had done this little intervention, the clinic went back to normal. and. Even though contemporarily in 1862 the germ theory was done by Louis Pasteur and 50 years later they started washing their hands again, um, you can see that there was resistance to um, the research at the time. And if we were to move that forward, probably about 600,000 people would have died as a result in today's birth rates. Um, moving ahead to the modern age, we continue to have some of these challenges. Um, to Eris Human was published, and this is more on the quality side than the research side in 1999. Uh, 98,000 people die in hospitals, according to the study, uh, as a result of medical errors. We fast forward five years. Um, the groundwork is laid, but it's frustratingly slow. We move ahead to today, or at least a couple years ago, and we find that very little has actually been implemented against the studies, and research has shown it takes 17 years before an evidence-based practice moves into clinical use. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, and these guys had trouble moving medicine forward. We're going to continue to have trouble moving medicine forward uh, in research informatics. So um, some of the major problems we're trying to solve, how can we run ad hoc scurvy style comparative effectiveness experiments with this growing EHR system infrastructure that the government's nicely paying billions of dollars to help us to implement? Um, from a open perspective, uh, 
really evidence-based medicine has to be an open process. We can't close off and have small studies and patent the fact that we know how to treat patients better. We need to be able to have systems that can be shared across different groups. Um, we have a lot going on. It's changing our health system, both in terms of the informatics they're using from EMRs, as well as new treatments and functions. How do we even know that we're hurting them versus helping them? And we're spending a lot of money, about you know, 20 to 30 billion dollars a year, and we get 30 new drugs per year, so we're not having a lot of success in finding new treatments. You know, there's, there's still, there's not a lot of lemon and lime type treatments left out there. Um, so something needs to change. And the argument that, that we and many of the folks that we work with have come to is that openness is what is needed. So in working with the folks at the Dartmouth Institute, Jim Weinstein, who's the CEO, um, he ran a study which was called the SPORT trials where he um, was determining the comparative effectiveness of back surgery versus non-back surgery, just giving people um, uh, physical therapy. And he spent about $8 million on the study, determined that in some cases certain back surgeries really had a, a, an effect, in other cases it was pretty much equal. And afterwards he was unable to use the software he had built. It was built by a proprietary vendor, and he is a researcher in coming back to this five or six years later says, whatever we're going to do, it has to be open. We can't be producing trials and studies and paying for infrastructure that costs us two to three million dollars to study one thing. There's too many things to study. So openness is needed in research. Um, we at Recombinant really focus a lot on the data piece um, and open systems to handle data, especially for uh, research and for also helping people with their quality of care. Um, we as a, a group, just to understand where I'm coming from, we, we do a bunch of things for groups around the open source platforms we support, mostly research data warehousing, some application development. Um, and we're, we're, we're focused on a, a very specific process, which is how do research studies get initiated, how do they get um, funded, how do they get executed. And so it, it, it starts with a researcher trying to do feasibility and that's where we're going to talk about one of the applications that we look at called I2B2, where the primary thing before you can run a study is you have to understand, do patients exist and does the data exist for me to be able to run this study? And that's a, a pretty big factor in being able to write a grant, which comes much later, and then be able to execute those studies and go forwards. So, you know, it's a complicated world. I don't want to try and go through this whole slide. I think the most important thing to note is we do have this challenge in clinical research which is a big wall, which we call in our world the HIPAA wall, which is that we're quite restricted in terms of what we're allowed to do with patient data. We have to be very careful not to just carry across protected health information about a patient and give it to a researcher, because there's some well-documented ethical constraints that have been put in place um, by the government, rightfully so, from historical problems. Um, to make sure that patients' privacy is protected and we're really always trying to benefit patients when we're doing these sorts of studies. Uh, but you can see there's a lot of parts and pieces to doing this clinical research function. There's managing tissue, there's managing clinical trials, there's studying de-identified data, there's studying identified data for uh, quality improvement, there's looking at genomics information. So it, it rapidly splinters into a lot of pieces of software. So. You know, how are we getting things done with open source in healthcare today? Um, before I start, you know, I, I'd like us to, to look outside of healthcare, because we're here at an open source conference, and the one thing that has come up to me, at least, when I'm looking at open source projects versus the ones we do in healthcare is they're drastically different. You know, if I look at the Linux projects and the things like Drupal, which is here, um, you see groups that have extreme commitment to external contribution. And I, I put up this slide because this is a Drupal uh, representation, and Drupal's logo is this Drupalicon. That is a bacon sculpture <laughs> produced by a Drupal developer, and that is a Drupal tattoo. Now, I'm not suggesting in healthcare informatics we get so um, involved that we start putting up CA Big and I2B2 tattoos on our arms. Um, but we don't engage our community the way that these open source communities, and we don't have the level of commitment where there's 5,817 developers integrated to build an open source project. And I won't go through what Dries Butert would do, but you know he's the rock star behind 
Drupal. And I think the big difference between a system like Drupal and what you see in open source in healthcare is he's one guy in his dorm room, literally, who galvanizes up to 5,000 people from scratch with no funding. And we in healthcare are putting in the billion dollar stimulus fund to go and build open source projects that people can use. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be investing. This is a little more complicated and there's a very different model. Um, but we have to look at what are we doing that's different and why aren't we getting that kind of model to function? Because among the big benefits we preach of open source is that as a large group all sharing, we're going to have much more scale than if we were just to call up a vendor. And if it looks like the vendor is really the US government, I think we're going to fail. Um, so the, the, the types of applications, and I'll, and I'll briefly touch on data management infrastructure. Mostly day to day, for us, data management infrastructure is lights on things. We don't pay much attention to it. Um, we don't worry about, um, I didn't even put the operating system on this slide, right? We, we worry about things up in the application tier that a medical researcher, a clinician is going to use day to day, a person in the lab is going to operate with and build systems for them. But we do have to think about some of the infrastructure pieces. And so I took a look at, well, what would be a good scorecard? How can I measure some of the folks that are the open source projects that we're working with? Um, and I think there's some key determinants that do signify for us success and maturity. Um, one is, is there a real need for this to be open source in the first place? Now, in the case of some of the applications I'll talk about, there definitely is. I'm not so sure about an EMR. There's plenty of really good EMRs. There's a market for EMRs. There's people going out there making money. Um, if there isn't a market need, we shouldn't be wasting our time. Um, does it have the leadership? Because I think one of the key determinants, you look at this folks at Drupal, um, it's one very charismatic person that it takes to push these projects ahead. Um, does it have enough funding to get off the ground? You know, unlike these charismatic projects, which are a homebrew position, we're talking about informatics projects to support a clinical trial that costs $10 million. So are we really going to get the funding to make it support a pretty critical need? Um, does it have a network effect? So if someone installs one of these, does that mean 100 other people should also install it so they can talk to each other? And the strength of the telephone isn't one phone, it's all the other phones connected to it. Um, was it architected in the first place to really be contributed to? Or was it meant to just be built by one group and control it forever? Um, is it ready to meet the needs of the market? Are people really using it? And I'd add in good for business academics and good for business commercial because among the things you see in successful open source is it's not just a free open source platform. There may be free as one of the benefits to get it deployed, but to really get it to be successful, there has to be a business behind it because no one's going to contribute uh, completely on their own. And academics' reasons for contributing are very different from our reasons at Recombinant. Um, 